This is a production of Cornell University. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Jacob. I didn't realize today was cassava theme, but at least I'll be talking about a rabbi which is a daikon. So there we go. Um, so for today, I just want to generally introduce the concepts behind one of my PhD projects to use deep learning models to model transcriptional processes across Arabidopsis and maize, and also show a little bit of the preliminary data that I've uh, done from this work. So just to start off, um, we're all very aware of the different methodologies used to locate causal loci over the past uh, decades of breeding. And we're familiar with QTL mapping and also GWAS that we've recently switched to because of its higher resolution. But we are still limited in our resolution because of linkage, and it's still very difficult to separate correlated variants with the actual causal variants. And so the question always remains, how can we increase the resolution to target those actual causal variants? Another thing we need to consider is that, uh, at least with QTL and GWAS, you are directly relating the phenotype with the genotype data through a linear model, and you're um, generally ignoring the complex nonlinear biological processes that underline these. And at least recent studies have, have begun to associate sort of the quantitative difference in uh, genotype with quantitative differences at the RNA level, the protein level, and also the metabolite level. And today I'll be focusing on how I'm uh, looking at the transcriptional level between DNA and RNA. So the flavor of a uh, deep learning model that I'm using is called a convolutional neural network. And you might be familiar with the term from the context of image recognition or image classification, where it's the current state of the art. Um, and since convolution is a matrix operation, the first thing we're going to have to do to our DNA is convert it into a matrix. And so the way we do that is we're simply going to have a, a matrix the length of our sequence and four columns for our ACTG. And we're just going to put ones in each column corresponding to the bases. So we're going to end up with a sparse matrix of zeros and ones. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take our orange box here, which is basically our sliding window. We also have corresponding uh, matrices known as filters, which I like to think of as sort of like position weight matrices for those familiar with that. Basically, it's a matrix that weights base occurrence in certain positions of the window over others. And what you're going to do is you're going to multiply those two matrices, well, do a convolution on two of those matrices, and the result you expect to be higher in the right column, which would be a, a, a very dark red color, if the two matrices are more similar, so if your motif is in the window. And so the way we can sort of visualize that is if we slide along the sequence, and now we've hit a match, and we get a high output value in the right-hand column. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to apply what's known as an activation function. And in this case, it's what's known as a ReLU. All the ReLU does is turn all the negative values to zero and keeps all your positive values the same way. And this is, um, this is one of the examples of nonlinear functions that we can use in, in neural networks. <laughs> so one diagram you may be familiar with if you've seen a couple of deep learning slides before is this architecture diagram of the fully connected layer. These are typically done after your convolutional layers, um, and they basically consist of a bunch of neurons that are connected to each, these are the white dots, to each of the output uh, labels from the previous layer uh, with a series of edges that each have their associated weights. And so all you're going to do for each of those neurons is take each of your output data, multiply it by the respective weight, sum that result, and apply another activation function, that's your result. And you're going to do this for each layer of your model. And then your final layer is your output layer, and that's just going to have what value you want, which in, this, in my case would be mRNA expression levels. So all of that is assuming you have all the parameters that you want. You have your filter matrices estimated. You have those weights estimated. But what if you're starting from scratch with a data set, let's say RNA-seq, and you want to estimate those parameters? How do you do that? And so we just call it training uh, neural networks or training models, which is essentially fitting a model to the data. And the way we do that is we divide our input data up into batches. For each of those batches, uh, well, first we're going to initialize all the parameters to small random values, and then we're going to take our first batch. We're going to make a prediction, which should be pretty bad because it's a, just a random model at this point. Then we're going to take the error from that prediction and the model architecture and feed that into a training algorithm. And that training algorithm is going to tell us the direction to update those parameters to minimize our error. We're going to repeat those steps until we're out of data. That's one epoch. 
And then normally you run a couple of epochs to converge on an accurate model. And I do want to emphasize that these filters I showed earlier, they start out random because you initialize them randomly. And as a consequence of the training process, they gradually become more defined as motifs, if you think of them as PWMs, position weight matrices. And that is one way that these CNNs can extract features from your data because you don't give it these filters in advance. It, it learns how to accurately predict expression by learning these motifs. So one of the common criticisms of deep learning models is that they're, even though they're highly predictive and they get strong accuracies, how do we interpret what they're actually learning? And they're generally considered to have low interpretability. Um, but in recent years, there's been a number of techniques to sort of open up that black box and interpret what the model is actually learning. One of the example of this is deep lift. And the way deep lift works simply is by taking a random background sequence or a reference sequence. It could be some random DNA or maybe tuned to the background frequencies of your specific organism. And then you take a true positive, let's say a gene that you expect to have high expression. You run both through the model and then you can directly compare the intermediate layers of the model uh, and determine basically what parts of the input are most predictive of changes in the output. So some recent results from, or not recent, but some previous results from a postdoc in our lab, Hai Wang, who gave the deep learning seminar at the beginning of the semester. He took uh, three ideas. One was to use the promoter sequence defined as 1,500 base pairs around the transcription start site, the terminator sequence, which is 1,500 base pairs around the transcription termination site, and also a combination of the two to predict expression using a CNN. And his results are on the right. And you can basically see that the promoter and the terminator model did the best um, with R squareds of about 0.45. And I do want to emphasize that although those uh, R squareds aren't that high, we don't expect to have an R squared of one to predict expression from cis regulatory sequence because that we know that biologically that doesn't explain all the variation there. So these are actually pretty good considering the input data. So another thing I'd like to talk about is how we can possibly extend this mRNA model to uh, generalize different tissues. Because we know that the DNA is the same in different tissues, but things like epigenetics can change, but the model isn't currently taking that into account. And so one way we can think of is by adding extra columns to this matrix that correspond to epigenetic signals that would be present and differ between tissues so that the model can uh, learn how to predict differences in tissue expression. And so one example could be methylation, open chromatin signals, histone modifications, and also other epigenetic marks. And another concept I want to touch upon is transfer learning. And the way I like to explain it is teaching an old dog new tricks. You have a model that you've already trained on one large data set that achieves high accuracy. And now you want to apply that model in another da related data set that's probably smaller. So if you train a model from scratch, you would not get as high of an accuracy probably. Um, but what you can do is um, freeze some of the parameters in the first model that's been trained on the related data set and, and uh, retrain only part of the model in the smaller data set. And you would expect to achieve slightly higher accuracies with smaller data. So how does that apply in our case? Well, if you take a, an organism like Arabidopsis, which generally has a more diverse and larger collection of RNA-seq data sets, we might say that we could train uh, more accurate models to predict Arabidopsis expression. Um, and so because we have a lot more data there, but if we want to transfer it into a crop species that probably doesn't have the diverse array of data as a Arabidopsis, well, how could we do that? Well, so if we go back and think about the convolutional neural network that I introduced earlier, this part of the network is sort of how you learn to, it learns to identify motifs, at least at the convolution stage. And then the neural network stage is really where it learns how these motifs interact together to regulate and modulate expression. And so if we, in this example, make the assumption that between, let's say, Arabidopsis and maize, these motifs are conserved that drive expression. Let's say they're transcription factor binding sites that don't change. But the way they relate to each other and drive high or low expression differs. So what we can do is take an Arabidopsis trained model, erase, let's say, the last layer's weights, and then retrain it on maize data, just those last parameters. And now we have a model that doesn't have to relearn how to recognize motifs, but can just simply be tuned to the 
uh, species specific connections. And so this is some preliminary results that I've done in a Arabidopsis using Heise model. And so what you're looking at on the left is a prediction of mean expression across all tissues for all genes in Arabidopsis. And what you can sort of tell is that it's um, similar in accuracy to Heise model. And if you compare uh, generally the distributions across all tissues is the models, what I want to emphasize is the models have comparable results. So they do also work in Arabidopsis. Okay, so the questions that I want to answer with the rest of this work is basically, can these multi-tissue transcriptional models be trained with epigenetic information? Is this a good idea and will it generalize across tissues? Another question I'd like to ask, answer is, can we train models on one species, for example, Arabidopsis, and then use those as useful starting models to retrain and retune in other species to achieve similar accuracies, but with less available data. All right, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the Buckler Lab and specifically Hi Guillaume and Catherine and Emery for their discussions on this project, as well as my funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Mike. You're training on the uh, rabbit ops data. Are you only training on one genotype per se? Are you or are you going into like a one thousand and one genome to try to improve as far as all yeah. that? Great question. So the question was, am I training on only one Arabidopsis genotype or all th potentially thousand and one? So currently I'm only training on Columbia Zero, the reference genotype, but the plan is to use all thousand and one genotypes. Are there any questions from Zoom? I don't think so. Okay, well, thank okay. you very much, Travis. Great. Thanks, guys. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.